Okay, so so good evening, guys. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode of, of Golang Live. Uh, this episode, I'm joined by the wonderful Alexander Begun from Begun Labs. Um, give a brief introduction to himself when he starts. Uh, over here at Amicus, of course, you'll, you'll stay tuned on our, our LinkedIn. Uh, I recruit entirely for Go all across Germany, uh, hence why I host these uh, Golang webinars. But you're not here to see me, of course. You're here to see the wonderful presentation uh, from Alexander. Of course, uh, any questions, uh, he's kindly gave us a permission to kind of stop him throughout, ask any questions, but of course there will be time uh, towards the end for any more questions and stuff. Uh, and if anything is missed, feel free to obviously catch the recording on our YouTube channel where it'll go live uh, potentially next week. Uh, and yeah, we can go from there. But Alexander, I'll give you the floor. So thank you very much for joining me. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm honestly grateful to Amicus for providing me this wonderful opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, the topic of our discussion today is software benchmarking and profiling in Golang. I'm thrilled to explore this topic with you as we aim to make our software faster, better and uh, more efficient. Uh, all right, let's uh, take a moment to see what is in store for our time together today. Uh, we have introduction. We will start off with a little about me, uh, so you know who is talking to you, and then dive into why benchmarking and profiling in Golang are so vital. Uh, benchmarking in Golang, we will explore how to write, run, and analyze uh, ben benchmarks. Uh, profiling in Golang, here we will demystify profiling from CPU to memory. Uh, we will look at how to identify bottlenecks and make your court perform like a champion. These two parts will include a live coding session as well to make it more extreme. <laughs> Integrating benchmarking and profiling, we will see how these two techniques work together to bring uh, out the best in your code. Then tools and resources, I'll share some of my Go tools and resources that make all this uh, benchmarking and profiling stuff even more enjoyable. And last but not uh, certainly least, Q&A section. I'm looking forward uh, to answering your question and hearing your thoughts. All right, before we dive in, here is a little about me. My name is Alexander Begun, and I am both the founder and the software engineer at Begun Lab. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can find all the details on the website at uh, begunlab.tech. Feel free to follow up uh, with me on, on GitHub. Uh, benchmarking and profiling are two important activities in uh, software development and performance engineering that help developers understand and optimize the performance of a piece of uh, software. Uh, benchmarking, this is a process of comparing your software's performance with the performance of other similar software or some predefined standards. This can provide a comparative perspective and give you uh, an idea of where uh, your software stands in relation to others in terms of performance. Benchmarks can be related to different aspects of software performance, including speed, execution speed, uh, memory usage, uh, disk space usage, network uh, bandwidth usage, etc. For instance, if you develop uh, a search algorithm, you might benchmark it against other popular search algorithms to understand its performance in various scenarios. All right, let's get to the code. Uh, we have a code. This is just a simple function uh, that will provide some overhead for CPU and memory. And we will use this function to uh, show uh, how to use a benchmark. Uh, the function is, is pretty simple. It just iterates uh, n times and appends the integer into the data slice. And that's pretty much it. Uh, let's go to uh, bench, benchmark main test here. 
and uh, think of writing a benchmark as a crafting a test because they both use uh, tools from the same testing packages. But there are a few things to remember. When you are creating a benchmark, the benchmark should start from the name benchmark. And then you can provide anything that you want. Uh, the next thing uh, to mention that uh, the testing tool doesn't run a benchmark just once as, as normally as, uh, as it normally done in uh, testing, but it will repeat this many times. And uh, as you can see here, we are having a B, which is a struct uh, for, for, that stands for a benchmark. And this will iterate the colon of your function that you want to benchmark by B, B, uh, Bn times. So in this case, what we need to do, we have to write the memory waste and let's say iterate to the 100 times. Uh, yeah, and basically that's it. Uh, the benchmark is done. Now we just need to run it. Uh, to run this one. Uh, we just need to write the go test. Uh, and we have to specify which which function you want to to run. And now we can see that we executed the benchmark. Uh, the first digit here me meaning how many times the memory waste were called during the default time, which is one second. And the next one is the number of, uh, this is a time per one operation. Uh, we can improve this benchmark and these results if we will type something like uh, bench mem which will uh, which will do the same plus it will highlight the memory usage for for this test as you can see now we have uh, 2000 bytes per operation and we do have eight memory allocations per one operation uh, yeah and we can improve it even more if we will uh, write a bench time, something like, uh, yeah, let's keep it just one second and let's execute it 10 times. Uh, the reason why I want to execute it more than just one time is that uh, when you are doing a benchmarking, it is quite important to ensure that your system is warming up enough to catch all the problems, the, the possible problems that can, uh, that can happen during the testing. And because currently I'm like streaming to the Zoom, uh, it is better to make more uh, than just one uh, sample because I want to, uh, I want to make sure that other processes in my system does not impact the benchmarking. So that's why we would increase it. And then let's just store uh, our benchmark result to the file. Let's call it origin.bench. So let's execute it. And while we have this execution, uh, you might notice already that we have eight allocations per one uh, operation, which is if you remember the function, I will switch it back to the function. You may find this, that is too much for such a simple uh, call. And yep, that's actually true uh, because uh, how we can actually improve the situation, we can allocate uh, the memory for the data slice right away because 
in this function, we are sure that we have a n number of uh, elements in this slice. So for that, we could do something like, uh, like this. And till n. Cool. I think this should have some impact uh, on a performance here. Uh, let's just see what we have in a region. Uh, yeah, we have some uh, some samples. Uh, we have ten samples uh, for the previous version of this uh, call, and now when I made the change, it is time to repeat a benchmark. Let's call it something like a refactor bench. Yeah, and now we are repeating the same procedure. Cool. We can check it. Yeah, it's here. And now it's time to compare the results. Um, the great way to do this is to use a tool that called Benchstat. Don't worry, I will include all the uh, links and tools uh, later in the presentation, so you will have all the materials afterwards. Uh, yeah, and this tool just have to receive a couple of files, our origin bench and our refactor bench. Now what you can see is there is a table with the two columns, one for the origin bench uh, for the first run and after the refactored version of the same function. Uh, you can barely see that we decreased uh, the usage of, uh, we decreased actually uh, the time per one transaction by 65%. Uh, we also can see that we have uh, less uh, bytes per operation by 56%. And we also can see that allocations are also decreased uh, by 87%, which is also quite nice. Uh, you can also see the numbers, which is N, e, P, and P. Uh, the N, uh, N here stands for the number of benchmark runs. And because, and because we run is 10 times, the N here is a 10. And the P smells for statistical measure uh, of the difference between uh, two benchmark results. And if this value is small enough, typically uh, less than 0 0.05, that indicates that you, you have uh, uh, significantly, uh, statistically significant difference between the two sets of these results. So that means that they are pretty uh, precise and uh, you can just ignore the value of P if it's just less than uh, 0 0.05. Uh, there is another way that you can use to run a benchmark. You can also do this uh, do this in parallel. Uh, for that, uh, you can call B. B run parallel. Then you can iterate for pb.next, which does pretty much the same as BN in the previous uh, example. And here you could run. In this scenario, uh, run, par run, parallel, uh, run parallel will create 
uh, as many uh, go routines as have in go uh, max prox environment and it will distribute the work among of this and the loop here will execute it bn times total across all the go routines and this uh, this benchmark is quite useful if you want to measure something like uh, HTTP handlers or some uh, other functions that should be executed in, in parallel. And yeah, pretty much the same. You can just run uh, that function. And then we can compare the results with the uh, previous execution yeah you can see here that we have different results and the bench start tool can also point that ratios must be uh, more than zero to compute uh, the means here and that means that we have to uh, redo all the same stuff for origin bench before for uh, to compute the difference between uh, these benchmarks uh, that means that it is better to not compare uh, dif in a different ways uh, calls for example it's not a good idea to compare the results between concurrent execution and uh, the one that you want in the serial call. Okay, um, so far we discussed fairly straightforward example, uh, meaning that memory waste is quite a simple function. But what should you do? E what what should you do when it's not immediately uh, obvious how to imp improve? Uh, a piece of code. This is where profiling can provide invaluable insights. Uh, while benchmarking gives you a comparative view, profiling uh, is about gaining an in-depth understanding of your own software. Uh, profiling involves measuring the complexity of a program. It is a process that helps to understand where it where the application spends its its time and memory by collecting data about the runtime of a program this is done to find bottlenecks and hotspots in essence benchmarking uh, gives you an external view of your software performance in comparison with other systems or standards while profiling provides uh, an internal view uh, helping you understand the software uh, performs in detail and where imp improvements can be made. Both techniques are complementary and are often used together uh, to fully understand and improve the performance of a software system. Profiling is usually a next step after benchmarking. Um, many of performance issues and challenges we face in Go applications stem from these three areas. Uh, inefficient algorithms, especially when dealing with large data sets, uh, hook our CPU and memory. Uh, blocking operations, uh, meanwhile, put us on hold as apps await tasks like, uh, I don't know, data reading, uh, network connection, disconnections. Um, and don't overlook the pitfalls of excessive memory usage. It can cripple even the, the most robust systems. Addressing these three uh, critical areas uh, is essential to optimize our Go application in maximum efficiency and user uh, satisfaction. Um, to find these performance problems, we can use a tool called PProf. Uh, while it's not an official Google product, but it's nice that developers of uh, Go decided to provide this tool for us because it's just amazing to have it. And uh, 
it's it's nice that they decided to do this right from this right from the start of the development of the the language. Uh, Iprof is a tool for visualization and anal and analysis of profiling data. Uh, Iprof reads uh, a collection of profiling samples in uh, some protobuf format and generates reports to visualize uh, and help analyze uh, the data. It can generate both uh, text and graphical uh, reports through the use of the dot uh, visualization package. And profiles can be read from a local file or over HTTP, for example. Uh, multiple, multiple profiles of the same time can be aggregated and uh, compared. There is some uh, profile types that we have uh, in a Golang uh, using pprof. It's a CPU profile. It measures which functions are consuming the most CPU time. This, this is one of the most commonly used uh, profiles and is great for identifying uh, computationally expensive parts of your code. Next one is a memory profile. Uh, has a few different uh, facets. It's in use space. It's just basically measures the live objects, uh, like the memory used by objects uh, that are still referenced. And allocated space, it measures all the objects that have been allocated, even if they've been garbage collected. Useful to see the overall memory allocation behavior in your app, so it's uh, just uh, total memory consuming. A block profile measures the time, uh, the time your uh, go routine spent waiting on blocking operations, such as waiting for a mutex lock or waiting on channel operation. Uh, mutex profile measures. Uh, the contention around mutexes, uh, how often go routines are blocking waiting to acquire a mutex, let's say. These two are less documented. Um, yeah, go routine profile provides a snapshot of all current go routines, which can be useful for diagnosing deadlocks, uh, go routine leaks, or other concurrency related issues. Thread create profile captures uh, the stack traces that leads to uh, creation of new operation system threads. It's less commonly used, but it can be useful in specific scenarios, especially when trying to keep the number of operation system threads under control. Debug traces, while it's not a profile in a traditional sense, Piprof also provides a way to look at the recent, uh, recent network and synchronization events. to help provide a more detailed look into what's happening in your application. Well, uh, the documentation on goal and profiling can be challenging to navigate, I would say. Often it demands some in-depth research. I'll and here in this slide, you can see that uh, the issue uh, that uh, requires uh, the improvement for the bl blocking profiling is still open. Uh, and yeah, I'll share some insights from my own experience on how to effectively profile in Golang using uh, the profile types described before. Cool. Let's go back to the code. Uh, we have another, another example here. Uh, we have a program that makes uh, a few simple things. It creates a new HTML document and it generates some content for it just to have uh, an overhead. And we also have a leaky storage because we want to simulate uh, the memory leakage. And uh, I want to show you how to detect it using the profile later. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. We just iterate 
hundred times creating hundred uh, different HTML documents. Uh, we are using a Go query package here just to provide some extra uh, overhead for the processor. Uh, yeah, and now we would like to measure, uh, actually not measure, we, we would, uh, we would like to profile this and uh, how this can be done. Uh, the one way we can use a pprof is to create the, the profiling files that we can analyze later. For that, we could do something like, like this. Let's create, let's see, CPU pprof. Uh, yeah, we would. CPU file and let's close. Actually, let's let's stop. Let's stop CPU profile and let's close the file. And that's it. Now, what we need to do, we just need to, to run this application and wait while the CPU PPRO file will be ready. Cool. We now have a pro the file. Hmm. It's empty. I think that might be because of this one start up. Uh, yeah, let's try once again. Now we have some data. So the next step, we we are ready to use uh, pprof itself uh, to visualize the data. So after that, we have to do go to uh, pprof, and then we have to show the file with uh, profile. Now we are entering the interactive mode for the pprof. So from here, we could run something, for example, like a top 10, just to see uh, the most CPU intensive operation. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there is some operations like uh, GC drain. So essentially there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of job for the garbage collector. collector. Uh, we can also uh, we can also generate a PDF to see uh, how to 
actually to, to see what's going on uh, visually here. Uh, in this graph, the must uh, the bo the bold arrows means the must uh, the, the more most popular way the program is follows here, and if you want to analyze uh, for with it, for the weak places, you need to follow uh, all the red uh, red blocks and red arrows because they are just a must uh, consuming parts from from your. Uh, program. As you can see, this is how it looks like from a CPU perspective. You can see that at the scan object, this is, uh, consumes the must from uh, from your program. It's a must uh, CPU time, and this can give you the idea of uh, where your software is spending much time and maybe that can point you to uh, to the to the line in the code that might uh, require some adjustments from here um, this is what you can do about the cpu uh, if you want to analyze the memory uh, we can also uh, have a profile for the memory. For that one, we would need to uh, include another file. Let's call it memory uh, file. Uh, prof write uh, heap profile to memory file. Mm. And yeah, let's exit from pprof. Let's run again. Our software. Okay. It's done. Uh, we can check that we have memory pprof, the file that uh, collected uh, the memory usage. Uh, now what we need to do, we need to go to pprof uh, memory. Let's have a... Now you can see the most expensive from memory perspective uh things in our code we can even do something like this and check in the code uh what the place consumes a must for example here on 20 second line uh you can see that it is a must uh must consuming part from memory uh, we can also generate another report to watch it in a graphical perspective. Here you can see that the generate HTML uh, consumes the must memory and that can give you some insights uh, and that might be the call for action to improvement. Maybe you can uh, check why it consumes that uh, amount of memory. Also maybe uh, it's nice way to change a library to something else because it's it's not so effective. Uh, another way to collect uh, to collect the pro profiles 
is to also have a HTTP server uh, because the PPROF also provides uh, HTTP server and the way it works is pretty simple. For that, you just need to add uh, these lines. <clears throat> you have to import uh, net HTTP PPROF this way and just need to, to run the server HTTP listen and serve let's something like Right now, what you can do, you can exit from from PPROF. Now we, we need to run again uh, the main function and now we are ready to consume uh, the profiles right from the server so for example you can run this in a remote server and collect it this way you can go go to pprof and go to just the server say debug pprof uh, unlocks this URL will uh, will collect all the memory allocations file for us. So profile completed. You can just do pretty much the same. As you can see, there is again uh, the same picture. Uh, you can again generate some reports and watch how it how it goes on your remote application. Um, and this is the way that you can use it in, let's say, in production system. The only problem is that, uh, not problem, but you have to remember that uh, not to expose the same, the same port, HTTP port, uh, because it might be not secure to expose the details. Uh, yeah, it was uh, quite popular too. It was a profiling for CPU and memory. Uh, this, uh, this visualization can give you some ideas uh, and some insights on how you can improve uh, your code. Now let's take a look uh, to the blocking uh, profiling. Um, we have another program here it's also quite simple uh it's basically writing and reading the data from one uh from the from one map called data here uh it also will use the mutex to synchronize the reading and writing operations uh, and it will also have an overhead which is slow function this one will blocks the execution for several milliseconds and now let's see how we can uh, how we can check uh, blocking operations um, because as i said these two blocking and mutex uh, profilers they are less documented and it's quite tricky to to get things done without knowing uh without having some experience so to to collect the blocking profiles we can do pretty much same uh thing like like we did before by creating the files uh, for that we can 
do some uh, some files. Let's go with create block prof. Uh, yeah, let's see. Return from this point and uh, we have to also we have a wait group to wait all the go routines to complete because we don't know we don't want to exit right away from the main function here. Uh, yeah, and what we need to add as well, it's uh, pprof lookup name and name it uh, block. Then we have write to f0. Uh, that's it. That's that's. Let's run this application. Okay, we are done. Let's check what we have. Oh, we have some block. Yeah, and one thing, uh, go to pprof block the prof all right uh it's empty and i think lots of people <laughs> have the same problem before this is something that is not so obvious from the pprof and from the documentation uh what's what's happening here is that when you creating the block pprof it is important to uh enable uh, the block profiler because it's disabled by default and you should uh, call this function from runtime set block profile rate which uh, i would uh, recommend to keep it to the one and this way uh, you can enable uh, the blocking profiler let's run again And let's see what we have. Now you can see that we have some data. Uh, the mass blocking is comes from synchronization, as you might see here, uh, from the right data. So we can list main write data from 21st line from here and that means that we are waiting for execution of the slow function so this way you can profile uh, the must uh, consuming the must uh, block blocked part of your code you can also do the same and generate the pdf uh, report if you want it also available as a web server if you need, by the way, I didn't tell you, but you can generate it to any uh, formats that you like. And here you can see that uh, we have a mutex, uh, the bottleneck that is comes from, from this mutex in uh, while we are calling write data. And this way you can navigate to the issue uh, with, uh, your, uh, with your code. And as a result, you might rethink how uh, how you're locking this function. Maybe you can 
somehow change the strategy for a, for a locking function. Uh, now let's check how we can uh, see the mutex profile. For that, uh, we would go to the main. Let's connect here. Um, let's create another file called mutex profiler. Uh, yeah, by the way, it should go here. Uh, we will disable this and we have to enable as well the profile of fraction for the mutex. It can be done by runtime uh, set mutex profile fraction to one. Uh, and we will look up for the mutex at the end. Good. Uh, running again, collecting some data. Index of top ten. Cool. You see the the main mutex contention from here is comes from main write data, which is. And here is just obvious uh, picture that you can see that it's coming from write data. The main contention from the mutex profiler is goes from uh, from the synchronization that we have in this write data function. So again, it points you to the same place and uh, helps you to navigate to that bottleneck. Uh, cool. Uh, this is how blocking and uh, mutex pro uh, profilers are working. Next thing I would like to show you is uh, is integrating benchmarking and profiling. So it's another way to benchmark and profile your applications is to integrate it with uh, SaaS. Uh, here is a list of some services which I have had a chance to work. Basically, uh, they provide a good experience for continuous benchmarking and profiling because they are continuously collecting all the information uh, from your application. It is worth to mention that they are basically built on top of this PPROF tool and just provides for you the infrastructure to visualize, uh, for visualization the data. Also, you can filter the data and uh, make some alerts or some other stuff that will help you to continuously monitor your application. Uh, yeah. Some links to integrate uh, the services that I uh, described before. You can check this out. Uh, there is a tools and resources that I used to uh, that I used in this presentation. So if I, I recommend I recommend taking a look afterwards if you want to integrate uh, some of these instruments to to your practice. Uh, key takeaways, uh, use PPROF to analyze uh, performance. Uh, it's not too difficult, I would say. Remember, if you want to use it in HTTP mode, uh, make sure to keep uh, it on a separate port so as not expose it in the production. If your security level allows you to use uh, SaaS, it could also be a great choice as it provides uh, continuous profiling. Uh, this is a significant step towards building observability of your application. 
Uh, generally, profiling has a low overhead and will not significantly impact uh, your production system. Uh, however, some types of profiling may have a greater impact than others. For example, the CPU one might uh, have some impact on your system. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Excellent. Just wanted to say, uh, obviously, on behalf of everyone here, obviously, thank you very much for the uh, for the for the webinar. Uh, one thing I'd like to say, uh, of course, it's really interesting for me to actually see some live coding. It's not really not very often I actually get the chance to kind of see uh, go in practice, so to speak. Uh, one thing I did want to add, uh, of course, all the tools and links that you mentioned uh, a moment ago, they will also be available. We'll put them underneath in the in the description below the the YouTube uh, video of this. We're going to post kind of kind of next week or so. Um, I've not actually had any any questions come through. Um, typically, a good sign must mean you've been incredibly clear in your explanation uh here we go one second uh oksana's just mentioned uh thank you very much very helpful uh so thank you very much oksana really appreciate uh really appreciate the the feedback there um and that's pretty much it from myself uh, of course thank you very much alexander of course please do check out alexander's website as, as long as as well as his, his github and uh, yeah, you can definitely catch the recording if you have any any questions that's popped to mind uh, next week or so. Uh, but from myself, obviously, have a great evening. Uh, I'll let sort of Alexander wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. And bye. Perfect. See you all later, guys. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.